Um, we're going to now go to our closing keynote speech. Um, I welcome to the stage Ashwini Seth. He is currently the Professor of Rural Economics in the Institute of Social Studies, The Hague, and uh, Professor of Development Studies at the London School of Economics. He has also taught and researched on a range of themes uh, in development studies with a focus on poverty. No, I'm, you're okay? Okay, but I do, I have, uh, I have been asked to mention that you are a close friend of Professor Vyaslu and you go back many, many years, apparent, uh, uh, under underestimation that I did, they go back way, way before um, college, which is what my estimation was, huh? Before CBPS, definitely. Uh, so thank you, sir. Thank you, actually, for coming to this conference and uh, for agreeing to be our closing speech so readily. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for, for the invitation. I'm, I'm honored. If you know, then I go back a long way indeed. But uh, I've never had the, the chance to be at CVPS to have this emotion. And I must say that I'm very impressed. It's quite a uh, monumental amount of work, which has been done, prodigious. And of, uh, we're looking through the, standing there, leafing through the publications, some very high quality work there. And I see that there are conclusions which come up, which are, um, could be running against the grain, and they seem to be fearless, and, and that's very nice. And I think listening to the young scholars here, uh, and I like very much that you've got young scholars from other places, other fellow institutes, sister institutes, and that was very nice as well. I think it's a very good gesture. Um, I, for, your, for your 30th anniversary, I might have a suggestion that all the big shots uh, should be seated in, uh, in front and the younger scholars should speak. And, and I think then they, they can react to, to what they say, because otherwise there is this culture of conferences where you speak and you go. And uh, so there's a captive audience to which a stream of uh, performers come, speak, and go away. And I think that there is uh, much to be learned by interactions, as you saw from the panel. I think the panels are, are wonderful to have. And I think uh, the interaction between panels and younger people would be very nice. And that's, those are the parts that I've liked best. Anyhow, the closing speech, after all this, I, I, I don't really know uh, what really would work. But I'm certainly not going to uh, say anything uh, to CVPS. I think it's doing very well, thank you. Uh, and I, th I wish you all the best. I think I'm, something may come up in the middle and I, I said I want to pick on a big theme. I, I'm, I'm an economist by training. Uh, I've steadily moved away um, from conventional economics. I, I, I'm a critic of conventional economics. I, I think it's more part of the problem than a solution. So uh, you have to look at a thing in an integrated manner, a holistic manner, which means social science. Uh, not just social science, but other contiguous disciplines as well. And I was delighted in the morning to hear a, a philosophical take on, on education. I think these are all things which we really miss. And the economics are lobotomized, uh, conventional economics. And I think they, and I said, it's not, not useful. So in, in that spirit, I'm going to go into a sort of a larger scene. Where does the CVPS, where, where, where does this, the, all the entire, the ship, all this of work of all the different organizations, uh, and there's been fabulous presentations, and, and all this work, which is behind this, uh, where does it, all that work um, um, belong in a, in a larger macro scene? I want to say a few words about the totality uh, within which I see all this. Um, so, and for that, well, I mean, um, I'm going to use a very simple heuristic kind of device. I've been a teacher for longer than I care to think, but certainly uh, nearly 60 years. So uh, it's, it's, it's devices for, for communication. Uh, think of a triangle. Think of a triangle. And at the top end is, is global capitalism. Okay? And you come down to one of the points, the next point, and it's inequality. And the third point is democracy. Okay? So I want to, to have a, basically a conversation between capitalism, the way. And people don't want to use the word capitalism. They think it's vulgar. People think, oh, you know, you know. But that's what it is, being run by capital. That's roughly what it is. It's been called that now for something like 250 years. No reason to get nervous or worried. So capitalism and then, of course, inequality and, and, and democracy. Again, a big D word. I'm not going to get into definitions, but I just want to sketch to you a few ideas about how I see the macro scene in these terms. And then I, we'll see, I think, 
that will show where we fit in some way. Okay, so let me start with this thing about the capitalism side, and I say a word about uh, the person who started all this at the bandwagon rolling in a big way, Adam Smith. His idea was that capitalism was harmonious with regard to the interests of all the different classes, including the working class. Uh, why so? Because although the working class was uh, receiving only a historically minimum wage, very poor and all that, and capital was running the show, uh, in due course, capitalism would actually generate growth, and the growth would absorb the labor. Eventually, when it absorbed the labor, wages would begin to rise, and lo and behold, the working class would begin to become beneficiaries and also owners of capitalism and so on and so forth. That was the idea. So it was a harmonious model, uh, and this comes up. Uh, if you see Marx, uh, Marx doesn't have this model at all, we know that. Uh, for him, um, the, the, the uh, labor was never get, going to get fully employed. There was always be a reserve army of surplus labor, because that's how capitalists like to have, always some surplus labor unemployed, because through that they could actually leverage wages and so on and so forth, extract more surplus value. It was an exploitative model and so on, we know all this. So this is one of the things which, uh, uh, so Marx is in a way not this. Now that kind of an idea, when we look at development, when you have planned development, say after the Second World War, say starting from the Bombay Plan 1944 and all the rest of it, and, and the work of Arthur Lewis, who's uh, again another development economist, Nobel Prize winner, who had the same idea that you know, uh, in due course, uh, capitalism, investments, uh, entrepreneurs will invest, they will uh, demand more and more labor, all the surplus labor which is there in the countryside will all be absorbed, and once all that is absorbed, then ca agriculture will start getting modernized in a way, wages will begin to rise, this is called the Lewisian turning point, and the turning point means that after that, labor is doing well. Now this was a model again of how capitalist growth was meant to become development in a, by itself through, through this investment. So the idea was have investment, now, there are only three countries, roughly speaking, which have actually followed this and got to a loose in turning point. One is Japan, and then, then it's, it has its two um, juniors, which is uh, South Korea and Taiwan. And, and that is historically at a time when uh, they were leaders in development. They were followers, but they were leading the, 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 the flock, the flying geese. They were the people who were behind uh, the, the original imperial powers. But no other, no other country has actually reached that lowest in turning point. We've had surplus labor in all of South Asia, we have surplus labor in Africa, there's surplus labor in, all, in Latin America. There's, so that, that surplus labor has not disappeared, and it's there very much. And I think that has very strong implications. I'll, I'll come to that as we, as we go. So that's one set of propositions. Another proposition which has come up uh, from another Nobel Prize winner, Simon Kuznets, who says, talks about inequality, and he says, Inequality, actually, in the initial phases of development, he's writing on the basis of evidence. The evidence is taken from eight European countries, historically, eight decades or something, but that is now looking at the 18th, 19th century, 19th, 20th century uh, decades. And he says inequality will first increase and then will decline. So this is called the inverted U curve. So everybody's now waiting, because we've all seen the rising part of inequality, that part of the curve we've all seen, but now everybody's waiting for that joyride going down where inequality comes down. It's, it's, uh, so my advice there is don't hold your breath. Yeah, so it's not a good idea, uh, especially because I think the head of the Department of Cardiology is not here. Don't hold your breath. You could, you could be in trouble. So, so I think that's another side which comes up from this. Now, I come back to Marx for a second. A couple of things that Marx said, I think become very relevant now. I think a Marx as a, uh, you separate Marx as a, as a, as a, as a person ad, of, of political advocacy, that's up to you, how, how you accept that model, how you go, but it seems as a historian of capitalism, as an analyst of capitalism, and I think there's some, nobody who can surpass that. Um, and now he says something there about the rising capital intensity, he called the organic composition, of how much capital do you use in the process of production per laborer and so on. And he says, there's a tendency for this organic composition of capital to rise. You're using more and more capital, more and more capital in relation to labor. The second thing which people very often forget about what he says, and I think that's most important, and he refers to a concept called the centralization of capital. And the centralization of capital is that capitals combine, firms combine, they become bigger and bigger. And I think that's it. Now, that tendency towards the centralization of capital, these all figure in, eventually in the dynamics of capitalism, but I just want to leave these two thoughts about the uh, rising organic composition of capital, labor capital and so on, more capital required for every bit of work you do, and centralization of capital where capitals come together, merge, form a larger mass. And so now, these are important uh, principles in it. Now, 
The joker in the back in this, uh, you know, I said to you, Japan and these early countries did manage it, uh, the turning point, others didn't. And now, why is that? And I just want to mention one thing, one, point, one thing here. You could say, well, you know, the growth rate could have been higher. If the growth rate is higher, they'll absorb more labor, you'll come to that point. So this is the standard answer. Uh, we say, well, you know, you need faster growth. And this becomes a legitimation of faster growth. Um, okay, but the joker in the pack is technology, technological change. Uh, if you see Japan, you know, there's in Toyota, there is a, there's a lot of work done on Toyota and car assemblies and how much labor it uses. So if you see over time how their models are for this production lines and the Toyota uh, process, which is just-in-time models and all the rest of it, they actually show how the use of labor is actually cut down steadily over the years, over the decades. It really comes down. Technology has been, is moved in directions where it actually becomes more and more capital intensive and less and less labor absorbing. And if you're a following country, if you're a follower country, it doesn't mean that you can avoid that. You may avoid it in service in something or the other and you know how you do your road construction. Even there you can't. Uh, but really, when it comes to industrial plant and equipment or infrastructure, you really have to use uh, modern technology. And modern technology has that attribute of being much more capital intensive and so on. Now, this leads, and alongside this, we have at the same time uh, better health, better, better public health. And in countries like India, uh, yes, the fertility rates are going down and so on. The rate of uh, population growth is not, uh, is not zero, it's not negative. There's a huge overhang of population, and overhang, I'm not saying there's too much, mind you. Uh, um, and there is a um, huge overhang of surplus labor. Uh, we heard from, uh, I heard, we heard from, from Rohit in the morning, and also another um, a, a person speaking, that uh, youth in the countryside don't want to be in farming. There's no future in farming. That's one side. But the other side is if you, go, you don't go into farming, well, you want education, you want to get out. You have to get into the town, that's where I want to go. Where are the jobs? Where are the jobs? So that's the problem, that's a crisis. There's an employment crisis at this point in time. And the work which is now assembling on, on labor and employment in India is really showing that it's not just, and India, by the way, has been having four, five, six, we've been saying thumping our chest and saying, oh, double digit growth and so on, okay, it's come down now with after these crises, but still, if you look at that whole period, you might be looking at 7% or something like this. Um, I don't believe the, the levels of those numbers too much because I think that GNP calculation is severely um, compromised by in what economists call index number problems. As services become more and more important, index number problems become very acute. But still, the growth rates are quite high. And with those high growth rates, uh, people are speaking, and these are serious analysts. Uh, Ajit Ghosh, who re recently died, unfortunately, an old uh, colleague of mine as well, KP Kanan, and so on. They're, they're talking not about jobless growth, but of job loss growth. So uh, th this is one side of it. The other side is that the idea was that there'd be a formalization of the workforce. Formalization is not happening. Uh, in fact, there are some tendencies, uh, both in the corporate sector and the government sector, that formal labor is being laid off and being contractualized, and through that it's becoming informal labor because they actually, uh, you, you want to circumvent the rights in terms of lives, rights of labor. And so the tendency, if anything, at this time is going in reverse. So there is, a, I, would, I wouldn't go so far as to say a dysfunctionality of, of labor with regard to the growth process, but it's almost the elasticity of uh, employment. The growth elasticity of employment is virtually close to nothing. I mean, you know, you, you, so you can't rely on growth to generate those jobs. Okay, so that's now. So here you have a situation where on the one side, you have, uh, if you see the, the, the tendency along with this uh, from the mid 70s, uh, since the time that neoliberalism really set in in a big way, and that kicked off with the, with the OPEC price rises for the third world, because with those price rises, they couldn't afford the oil, they have huge debts, and they couldn't pay the debts, so the IMF stepped in as a money lender, and they laid their conditions, and the conditions were, were basically get rid of state-led accumulation, it's not state-led models of development, it has to be through the market, and so on. So that became the, 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 you know, the Bible. And now with that Bible, you have really also capital flows are made uh, open, trade is made open, and we know that the international uh, boundaries and the fences are taken down. And that's led to an explosion of, of uh, global trade um, and, and capital from the West flowing in and uh, moving around. Um, and what has, if you take the state away from the investment process, which was meant to be driving in uh, the growth process in, in development in India as well, you know, plan models, all that, if you take it away and you say, well, um, 
What are you left with? Foreign direct investment. The foreign investment will have to come in. Make yourself attractive, get rid of labor laws, do this, do that, yeah, and so on, and they, they'll come and invest. Now, the trouble is that that investment is not doing all that well. And when it is, it's not generating growth. And a lot of that investment is really hot money, is looking to jump from country to country, and actually is part of the problem. With financialization, the uh, number of dollars which you say would have as money or near money, which can be used as money in the markets, uh, if you take that per one dollar of real GDP, now I can give you a number for, from about 10 years ago, it was 15. There were 15 financial dollars for one dollar of real income. And that number has now multiplied by a scalar. So you're looking at a multiplicative factor for how finance actually jumps when the real, and the, the, the impact on the real economy is really massive. So all the crises that we've had recently, apart from generated by wars and, you know, uh, and, and, and pandemics, uh, they, they can be traced to some of these financial pandemics. Now, the funny thing about pandemics is, now we know it from India, from Mr. Uh, the uh, Ambani Adani uh, combine, that uh, their wealth, not just theirs, but every major um, top 10, top 20, top 100 um, Forbes billionaires, their wealth jumped up um, proportionally hugely in, in every crisis. Every time there's a financial crisis or a COVID crisis, incomes of the people go down, their wealth actually shoots up. So this combination of an openness and of this new model and this, what I said to you about the centralization of capital, companies merging, companies merging, buying this, buying that, all this, has led to an enormous, uh, 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 what shall I say, intensification of inequality. And this is there everywhere. This is there everywhere. Some will say to you, uh, oh, you know, global inequality has not risen so much. Uh, you know, um, India and China, so beware that thing, because I think there is a Chindia effect in that. Because in India, they recite India and China. Because of India and China, global inequality is here. Yeah. But the trouble is in both in India and China, we are some of the world leaders in increasing inequality. But we are at the lower end of the global income scale, or the low middle, and so when our share, when our weight in the global average goes up because the income is rising much more here, global inequality gives you the idea that it's actually not rising that fast. But the reason why the global inequality is thought not to be rising that fast because of India and China, but inside India and China is rising probably faster than in most other places. So it, it's a, that's what I'm saying, it's, it's inequality is rising hugely. So this is the second part of it. Now, the third part is that we are told that capitalism, the legitimation of that was democracy, uh, which came to Switzerland, Swiss women, about a few decades ago, three decades ago, the last canton there to actually give the vote to women in Switzerland, I think not more than 30 years ago. But India did very much better. We, we've had democracy for quite a while. Now, one person, one vote has been the legitimation of, of this, and it ties in with capital ties into the idea of consumer sovereignty, I have money, I can spend, therefore you will produce what I want. Actually, it's in reverse. We are looking around, to, we buy things which are there, which are available rather than the other way around. So now that's the thing about democracy. Now, one person, one vote is there in many places. Now, here I pose my uh, problem with this trinity. And I think it's, a, it's an unholy, unstable trinity. Uh, I put it like to you like this. These are very simplistic things, but I just want to give some, convey some very large moving ideas here. If capitalism breeds extreme inequality, and I think that's at this time really has been the case in the last, since the 1970s, with a few blips intensifying, it breeds inequalities. One person, one vote. So if you see the countries themselves, inequality, how is that compatible with democracy, you should expect that if one, there's one person, one vote, and there's huge inequality, and people are being left out, left, right, and center, that there'd be some kind of a reaction to that. And what they say in India, we are savvy, we, vote, you know, we were talking about this, the vote with their feet, they would vote and bring somebody else in. Uh, countries would bring back you know, um, some, some sort of a more socially minded. So, so the idea that there'd be some sort of a reaction from, from the people uh, because they have the democratic right, the entitlement to react against this rising inequality and this kind of capitalism. So this is the instability of this trinity, which I call a very unholy kind of a trinity. Now, that's the thing, and I want to see, I want to ask now, if that's the trinity, how does a government, how, what really, how, how do you cope with it? How does it, how does it happen? 
I mean, how is it um, to be managed if you see it from the point of view of governmentality, yeah, from the yeah, people on the top? Now, the first thing you could say is, well, make growth in, in more inclusive. That will take the pressure off. But as I said to you, neither technology, nor the rates of growth, nor FDIs, none of them have the power and the capacity to make growth inclusive to this point. That's roughly speaking a non-starter. We've been talking about inclusive growth now for 20 years. It's not really there. So I think I would say that that's, you can keep talking about it, try and make it happen. There's not much purchase in it. The second thing you could say, well, come to inequality. Try and change inequality. And uh, well, you know, uh, Josna has written this thing or she's just spoken about wealth taxes and that kind of thing. So, and so the idea would be, well, you know, you can attack inequality and, uh, and reduce inequality. Well, you certainly can try. You certainly can try. But I think uh, governments which have been brought up through that whole system, through the neoliberal framework, and they're actually the, uh, doing the work of neoliberalism, and they believe that sort of a model. And mind you here, I'm not talking about the current government here, in the, the India government in India, if you want to look at India. The model started, and this is one of the points I want to make. One of the reasons why we're in this place of extreme inequality is because of this model. And the model started in 1990 in a big way. It didn't start 2014. So in, in, in fact, they're one of the things which they say, and you don't find a critique coming from the Congress on this. They will talk about corruption or this, that, or the other, but it doesn't come, your model is all completely wrong. You can say, oh, you're leaving this out, leaving that out, but Narega, for instance, didn't start in 2014. Narega started in the period of Manmohan Singh. And it was Manmohan Singh and co, and Montek and so on. These are the people, the finance people, who were actually hostile to the idea. It was people like Aruna and others, and Saxena and all those who actually wanted, and John Andres and all, who were trying to push it through. The civil society was trying to push it through. So you had a, inside that thing, the left and the right. Uh, the left hand saying, well, you know, what about the people? And the other one saying, well, what, we need the growth. You know, so, so that's a kind of a balance. So that happened before all this. So I think that there's a, if I look at this thing about how to manage it, uh, handling inequality, uh, and making it, they would say, well, if you do that, foreign direct investment will not come in. People who can invest will go away, the usual sort of arguments. And they may be true to some extent. Uh, because it, uh, multinationals, uh, corporate, they're all, always looking for things against tax and they can arrange it. So governments yield very quickly for, for lower tax regimes and so on, making exceptions and so on. So inequality is again, not very much of a, of a chance of doing too much to it. Then it comes to the question of democracy. How do you, uh, what do you do about democracy? But democracy, they'll kick you out. Ah, now we are coming to the zone that we've been talking about. So here you come now to a zone of uh, what do I do? Um, so I say there's inequality, uh, there's not much growth, uh, we could be voted out. Uh, how do we handle the situation? So then I think you start getting options. You imagine a discussion between the cabal, the internal sort of, uh, you know, seniors, the honchos of, of uh, the powers that be. So the first one, would, I think, would be to uh, manipulate the narrative. At the height of the um, UPA, uh, business about inequality rising and growth having, causing all these problems of exclusion, uh, I remember there was a, uh, something like six months, there were ads on every major channel in Europe, India shining. They were beautiful ads. I mean, you, you saw the thing, and you say, oh, you know, I'm going to take a flight and go back home, you know, and so on. I mean, the tourist um, agents couldn't do better than that. India shining. But people are saying, but look at me. It had the opposite effect, in a way, because it just brought home to you, India shining, and you said, uh, and so you felt that. So you can try and manipulate that sort of a narrative um, by saying, you know, by creating something. Um, but really, you need more than that. So let's see now. Um, and here we are now looking at the, uh, so that's one, manipulate the narrative. I'll come to the second one could be, have a new narrative. So now what's a new narrative that I'm talking about? Here so far what I'm saying to you is, there's extreme inequality, people are being left out, exclusionary growth. So it's all about the material, economic, social entitlements, that sort of a thing I'm talking about here. But a citizen is a citizen, and uh, so all of you are being excluded, so you say, oh, you know, that's, so that's uh, manipulate that narrative, but then you do something different. You say, um, like Jeremy Corbyn was about, there was a good chance that he would get elected in the Labour election when the Tories got in uh, earlier, Theresa May and co. And how did they stop him? They stopped him by all of a sudden, there being a complete agreement 
the media entirely blasted it everywhere, everybody, that there's anti-Semitism in the party, in the Labour Party. Now, that immediately created a situation, was a, I think, supremely well-managed situation. There probably was anti-Semitism. I'm not denying that there is. I think anti-Semitism is quite deep and quite well spread out uh, in every party. Uh, you know, and they, these are attitudes and things which haven't gone historically. But, but that was the basis on which uh, Jeremy Corbyn was effectively kicked out. In fact, his number two, who is Keir Starmer, who is now the Labour leader, has actually said that he cannot stand as a Labour candidate, even though the local constituencies who were meant to select the candidate actually want to select him. And he was extremely popular. So now that's what I'm re referring to as a new narrative. So the whole idea of inequality in, in Britain or people being left out, the National Health Service or what's going on about you know, wages, real wages, it, it got washed away from this. They said Labour is an anti-Semitic party in a way. That, that's the way. Now what, I, I mean, I hardly want to need to draw the parallel for, for, for India. So you shift the whole uh, frame of, of reference to something else. And that, so as soon as you bring in the question of Hindutva and, you know, Bharat and these thousand years of, of oppression, and things, you change the narrative. So people are responding now in terms of how they vote and what they think about, not in terms of inequality and exclusion in the labor market. And they, they had, that is their experience. That's the experience. But at the same time, they react now and they are manipulative. They are, they are uh, fish on a hook. And that hook is of, of this other kind. This, so you can shift the, change the agenda. So that's the second thing which you can do. Third thing, of course, is that you start, you can co-op people, you can incentivize people. Um, you can also incentivize in the sense that, you know, if you don't do this, you will lose your job. It's amazing how quickly and without a, a squeak, virtually without a squeak, there are some who have squeaked. Uh, some have shouted, some brave people. But the civil service has just completely gone silent. Who has stood up from the civil service? Have you had 20 people resigning? There are letters which go around, as we all know, which are from retired people. And they do very well. They write brilliant letters, but they are retired. And even there, I think they can get knocks on the door. But the civil service, quite, and I think civil service, in a way, is within their rights to say, say we follow the government. They are elected. They're not elected to take political positions. They are elected. They are, they are, they are selected, and they are, their job is to follow the politically elected leaders. So I think they can say, this is what we are doing. We don't like it, but we do that. Foreign service, the same. The speed with which these have changed, and people are quite enthusiastic if you're in the embassies abroad about the, about the change as well. Maybe they have to be. I was in China a lot, for many, many, many times, and I remember uh, in the time when it was very Maoist, uh, in 1978, 79, uh, he had died, but, and then suddenly, two years later, three years later, when I went there from 1983, it, it was all anti-Maoist um, uh, collectivism, and their slogan was, seek truth from facts, which was one of the slogans of Mao, seek truth from facts. So, and so when we spoke to the people in the same place, the same commune, the same place, they said, yeah, you know, but we've discovered new facts, and these are the facts, so we've, we've changed our mind. So, and I think this is what you're getting, in a way, uh, here as well. So we have, we have the facts now of uh, what happened in the last thousand years, and so on and so forth, and more, blah, blah, blah. So you can change your, um, I, I think you can incentivize, you can change the narrative in this way, you can buy co-opt. So that's one type of a thing you can do. Another thing you can do, of course, is that you can, um, and this is now getting directly closer to the control of, uh, control of the pillars of democracy. The executive, we know. Legislature, I'm not going to say very much. But uh, the, uh, the challenges to the, uh, to the legislature, uh, including, uh, well, let me just leave it there, were, came from uh, Shashi Bhushan. If you, uh, this is the current Prashant Bhushan's father, I think. And he had actually uh, made the original uh, statements that all was not well, yeah, in, in, in the senior judicial ranks uh, in the courts. And that was, again, in the time of the UPA. And it was much earlier. It's, it's a long-standing kind of a thing. It's not dating from now. But of course, what has happened is that the, uh, the, uh, there's an in intensification of the, let's say, I mean, the recognizability of uh, what people might say is, is a sort of a tendency for a biased decision making or to fall in line and so on. And I, I'm not going to take it beyond that, but we know exactly what we're talking about. The thing which is, um, yeah, I think it's compromised. I think the judiciary is seriously compromised at this point in time. And um, um, not least because of um, their ability not to take uh, you know, decisions and, and so on. So 
And then, of course, this comes to um, the legislature. Uh, uh, won't go into that because you, again, legislature, you might win an election. Uh, you might be very close to it, whether it is in Goa or it is in uh, uh, some other, uh, so many other states, three or four other states. And then you find, yes, where are your people? And there's, we have this India wonderful phenomenon, post-electoral holidays, where people are just shipped and taken out on uh, planes and buses and put into hotels. Uh, some people in Europe ask me, what is this? Uh, I said, sit down, I'll try and explain. It might take some time, you know, but they, so the question of buying people off after they've been elected um, is a fairly become uh, one device. The other, of course, is just getting elected because you have the money. And um, uh, there is, this is not India alone. Uh, every country, if you want to stand for election, you, it's now expensive business advertisements and so on, and going out, travel, transport, people to do this, they have to be, you know, they have to be fed, they have to move. They're... So, and I think the, uh, who knows the numbers, but the numbers which are casually thrown around three times, four times, uh, for BJP more than everybody else put together. I mean, those are the kind of numbers we have talked about. So I think there's, there's, there's that side to it about elections. And of course, then it comes to the media, whether it's print, TV, and if you see the uh, scroll in just now, this afternoon, you'll see there's, I think now about you know, on the digital media. There's something quite now big which is starting off on the digital media, which we, I, well, Siddharth so was saying that they are relatively protected, but uh, there's, I haven't managed to read the piece which has just come, but I was curious about this. Information, um, this controlling, I mean, as an economist, you know, we pride ourselves. Um, the professor from NEPA was telling us about you know, all these institutions or statistics. And yeah, India is one of the leaders. The National Sample Survey is, a, is an organization which is almost unmatched in, to, in the world. Um, ISI is again that sort of a ranking institution. Uh, statistics generally, uh, in terms of capacity to collect and, and process, is, 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 is phenomenal. But what's been happening, and this again is a tendency which has started many years ago, it started under the eye of Dr. Manmohan Singh and uh, Montague Singh. They, and I, I, I'm, I'm, and I must say, he was one of my teachers, our teachers, uh, were very unhappy about this. You know, um, consumer expenditure surveys, you cut down the periodicity. So you, you don't know for many years what's been happening. Employment, uh, do the same thing for employment data, labor data. Some labor data, because employment data shows that actually employment is not doing well, you suppress the report, uh, and so on. It's, it's, it goes on like this. So in a way, you're flying blind. GNP doesn't show this. You change the whole basis for doing GNP, and so, so the series are. So there's this, this side of, of manipulation of, uh, of, of statistics as well, which uh, in, in all this. And of course, you can say right to information. Yeah, it's great bill, great act, but uh, it's, um, Arunaji was saying, you know, 200 people have died in that, yes, I, you know, and, and one of those people. But I think it's, it's been clipped very strongly. It's not so straightforward to, to get information out on anything which is really meaningful. It's not so straightforward using the RTI in this thing. So I think that's uh, another kind of thing. Of course, if these things don't work, um, what do you do? Uh, you know, wasn't it Churchill who said, um, yeah, you, can feel, you can fool all the people some of the time, some of the people all the time, but not all the people all the time. So that would give you hope that in due course, you know, this vote business would be co corrective. But we don't need to um, fool uh, or not fool all the people all the time. That, that does not have to happen. You only have to fool the people or most of the people, enough of the people, for some of the time when elections are coming around. It's a political cycle. That's where you have to control the narrative the, and so on. That's where you have to control it. You don't need to do it all the time. In fact, the rest of the time you go the other way and that gives you greater credibility. So when you want to control it, it becomes like, oh, you know, both sides are there and so on. So I think that's, that's, that's a scenario which is there for, uh, for controlling. But um, if that doesn't work, uh, where do you go? Where do you go? And I think um, that then ends, I think, brings in the, the arm of the state, which is state power. Um, and that's the coercive power of the state. And that course of power of the state uh, can be exercised in many different ways, and it has been. Uh, when I referred to you this thing about this unholy trinity, India is not the only country, a country which demonstrates that sort of a connection. If you see uh, Brazil, you see the same. If you see the UK, you see the same. 
If you see um, uh, China, you see the same. Uh, you, know, you know, redefine democracy in some way, which is appropriate, but growth and inequality and uh, labor adoption problems are the same there. Um, Turkey is, 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 is the same in this regard. So you have quite a few countries which have exactly the same sort of a pattern. But if you see these other countries and say, how are they managing this, using the state uh, instruments of control, and look at Turkey, very vicious uh, in this regard, uh, very sharp. Um, UK, they can't. Uh, the forces are far too balanced, and I think it's a far too mature for that sort of a thing to be allowed to happen. China, they can do more or less as they like uh, in this regard. And the Hong Kong cases, you know, it, it shows you how they can play out. Hong Kong is distant, so they could do it over time. But really, if you're, something is happening inside the country, it could be much more uh, effective and, and quick. In India, well, the tax authorities, the CBI, enforcement departments, at a local level, lynchings, um, catching something or the other, could be uh, different levels, different scales. Uh, you have different kind of uh, signals which are sent out. I, I, I read something from Mr. Kejriwal, um, uh, who said that there have been, I don't know, he said 150 plus cases of the um, investigation by the CBI, but only four or five have actually yielded any, any charges. And the rest are all just, you know, uh, sort of um, knocks on the door to actually take you out of the, uh, the reckoning. So that's, that's the kind of thing about, um, so all these things come into play. And now you might think that, you know, philanthropy uh, could step in. But let me give you one other thing that you, governments can do and have done. If you take that model of growth, okay, even when there's high growth, it's not getting through to the people. A lot of inequality, they're getting richer. Democracy has to be stabilized. So one of the th ways you do it, you use inequality as a basis for being able to, the other side is the handouts. I said to you, Narega, but it's not just Narega. If you see the, the government schemes at this time, it is bewildering, it's a forest. It's a forest. Um, I did, and Ajay, um, Sirojini's cousin, my, and uh, Viroz and my uh, exact contemporary, we went to the village in UP in 1970 or thereabouts. And then we did some longitudinal data 20 years later, blah, blah, blah. And there was very, a very light touch of the state in the, in the village. Uh, hardly anything. There was no road construction, hardly anything going on. Um, Patwari was there. The block development officer was somewhere or the other, would come occasionally. But apart from that, nothing. Dug wells, tube wells, private, nothing else, nothing happening. If you look at the village now, uh, you can't, I mean, you get lost in the anagrams. You know, what's, I mean, it's like an anagram. I mean, what scheme, what is happening? The million, everything is schemes. Everything is money coming in one way or the other. And if you have that inequality, which you can tap in as a resource in some ways from the government revenues, uh, the whole model now is let there be unequal growth and we'll stabilize things by handouts. So we are a society at this time of extreme inequality with handouts trying to st stabilize democracy and to give some basic things to people about which we are all trying to struggle and fight to, to get this and that and so on. This is what's happening. So the, you take, I, I'm sorry to be such a, um, you know, sort of a misery ball, but if you think of uh, Narega and everything else, uh, what I'm saying about what's happening in the, in the labor market and jobs, this uh, includes uh, jobs in Narega. I mean, it's not as if they are unemployed, you know, that, that employment is not uh, counted if, if you are counted. In. So despite all that, this is what's happening. So we are in a handout on extreme inequalities, but it has the effect, there are two effects here. One, it legitimizes that kind of a model because you get your, entitlements through it. So it becomes easy to legitimize. Governments can say, oh, we are doing this, we are doing that, we are doing this, so it's your, uh, yeah, this scheme, this scheme, scheme. This becomes very handy at, at election times, even otherwise to stabilize your popularity. I heard Shekhar Gupta the other day saying that, oh, this government does so well. You know, forget about Hindutva, but they are delivering on schemes. So, but they're also delivering on inequality, they're delivering on other things as well, and all the rest of it, but there it is. So these schemes are becoming a legitimizer of, of that model. So that's one kind of, and it's also legitimizing inequalities. Because you say, this is the golden goose. Uh, this is what actually, you know, they are wealth creators. And as I said to you, they get, if they get richer, okay, TK, but you know, so Adani is our boy. And how dare they attack from some company from the outside? I don't know, you know, uh, the basis of it. I'm not a SEBI person or a, or a corporate lawyer or the financial person. But I think there are some grounds there for actually investigation. So why should there not be grounds for investigation? If they are, okay, fine, you, you do your books, but it becomes a national scene. So they become national icons. And I think this is the kind of a thing. So we had with, 
In the era of Mrs. Gandhi, I think we had the rise of Ambani and Manmohan and so on. I think uh, Manmohan Singh's in that time, the Congress. Ambani was a, a, a largely a, a previous UPA uh, sort of, what shall I say, helicopter man in the corporate sector. And so you get there, again, a centralization of capital. The fields are everywhere. They go everywhere. There's been talk about aren't there good um, philanthropists around? And there's a wonderful, there's a big portrait of JRD outside. And who would want to say anything negative in this regard about JRD or about Azim Premji and so on? But I'll give you an example of, um, to, to balance it, Bill Gates. The WHO uh, spends most of his money. First of all, the US government doesn't give them the money when they have to, huh? they hold it back. But leave that out. WHO uses most of its money on wages and salaries and pensions. They're not starving, mind you. They're on UN salaries, so they're perfectly all right, thank you. But that's where the budget goes. That's where the budget goes. Where is the budget then for research, for taking initiatives, doing something beyond just the payment? What should people do? I mean, if they have to do things, they have to go and do things. There are programs. For that, you need money. Don't have that, sorry. Not much. Come tomorrow. So if you come in, and there comes Bill Gates, and the foundation, they give them money. And that money is sitting on top, yeah? They're not paying for salaries and so on. Let the UN pay for the salaries. They come in on top with, and they set the research agenda because that's where the research money is. They are the controlling hand. So if you want a new green revolution for Africa, and Agra, whatever, and so on, that's where the money is. Now, the point is, are those people accountable? Have they been elected? Um, are they part of democracy? Um, and so on. Now, the, strangely enough, the biggest supporters of the universal basic scheme were people like Zuckerberg, Bill Gates, and all these super billionaires. They liked it very much because they're stabilizing things. So anyway, so that's the kind of a thing which I wanted to mention to you, that there is a, um, this kind of a model that we're looking at. And, and this is why I think whenever we work in, in the field, we must know what, what are we part of? What's the totality? This is the totality roughly speaking. I mean, I've, I've obviously simplified and I've jumped over things, but I think the broad, uh, broad brush stroke is, I, I would be able to defend it if there was uh, a bilateral or other sorts of discussion in this. I, I, I would certainly be able to do it. Now, I should close. Um, so I said it's an unstable, unholy trinity. So what's to be done? Um, now, I don't have solutions for this. I think solutions, um, uh, I was listening with uh, deep in thought to, to the idealism, philosopher's idealism in the morning. Rohit, I think you are, I was, I was moved by the, by, the, by the idealism and the generosity of opinion that, you know, must, must have that moderate, even, I mean, imagine moderate openness to each other as well. But you know, I think it's Wittgenstein, if I'm not mistaken, another philosopher, he said in order to have a conversation, there has to be some commonality. You have to be somewhere on the same platform where you're visible to each other, otherwise there's no conversation possible. Now, the question it raises to in our minds, it is not that it's happening everywhere. Indians are argumentative, we know that from uh, our, our dear Professor Sen and all this. But the point is, and our arguments are the heart of democracy. Discussion, free speech, arguments, uh, disagreements, and Indian disagreements would be quite loud, uh, very nice, uh, convergence, divergence, and then you say, okay, I vote for this, this is my party, this is my this, and you go and do it. But beyond that, uh, in the process of that, and even after that, there are certain boundaries which you do not cross. And that's been the nature, of the, and we've now gone to the Constitution to say what are the boundaries you don't cross, where, where is it uh, that we don't, but if you actually are well beyond those boundaries, and those boundaries have been, those fences have been taken out. If those fences are taken out, then I think the pre-requirements, that idea of moderation, that I think was so well stated in the thing, that moderation, if that is not there, uh, then uh, I think Roy was saying it's a generational thing, start the process with the, but yes, there's no question that should be, the long term starts now, so you know, yes. But in terms of where we are, I think something uh, has to do with um, a political, uh, we need some form of politics which, which will change things. And I don't, I don't have an answer. Um, I, if somebody does, um, they should have been speaking and uh, cheering us up. But uh, I, I fear that the answer has to be um, in and some alternative model, uh, or not model, 
in its alternative process, uh, but that process has to be a macroeconomic process as well. Uh, the Marxian kind of a hope that crises will bring the system down. As I said to you, every crisis, they get richer. And it has become, every crisis become the legitimizing uh, factor for governments to take greater control, to take greater control. Just like in COVID, the government could take greater control in terms of your data. And if something else happens, there's more control over surveillance. So it, it, it's a bit like that. And they, so I think in that situation, uh, there's no prospect of that old John Reed uh, 10 days that shook the world or, uh, you know, velvet revolutions and so on. So for this India, we are talking about something which is a very low gravity, vast, diverse, uh, great place. And I, I think, uh, um, so if there is an answer, maybe it is that it's a long-term generational fight, fight, they said, you know, all the time. And, uh, but I think it's good to have some alternative in mind. There are alternatives, people are talking about, economists are, but how you go from here to there, I, 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 I fear, I, I, do not, I do not know. Now, to CBS, uh, to uh, CBS, what do I say? I think, um, ask the right questions, and I think you have been, and pursue them fearlessly with evidence, with good method, you're doing that. Uh, do it without any um, party affiliation or identifiers, most important. It's a social question, it's an economic question, pursue it as such. Um, you're looking at a scheme, you're looking at a scheme. Uh, what I've said about where the scheme's from, the legitimized, no, that's not the point to make at all, nothing. What's the scheme? Analyze that. Let that work accumulate, which it is outside. So I think that kind of a thing builds a, 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 a body of, of, of opinion. Um, and I think it, we can only hope, it, it can't be proven, <laughs> that this adds up to something. Uh, but all the struggles, they have to connect in some form. Um, will our opposition leaders, in some way, of the opposition, I think that's where the real weakness is. If you ask me, yes, we have a hologram-like charismatic, uh, many other words were used, um, leader, yeah, comes almost like out of Animal Farm or somewhere uh, 1984 or something like this. Uh, Vishwa Guru, indeed, uh, that's the word. So we have that. Um, now these people in all these systems, if you take uh, Brazil and Bolsonaro, he could speak to the people um, he burnt down the Amazon, by the, by the way. You know, he's just doing, he's doing all kinds of bizarre things. But he could, say to the, he could speak to the people, and he could say, and you would think people are going with him. But Lula is one again. He has come back. He has come back. So there is a possibility. And it seemed as if uh, Bolsonaro had it all stitched and sewn up. Um, Trump looked like the same way. Uh, so many of these people who look as if they're extremely strong in their moments of glory and full strength, uh, they, uh, they, their power is brittle because underneath, if you're actually excluding large masses, the masses in the end, the gravity will have its say. Uh, so I, I think that we are, what we are lacking in relation to that great hologram is, is any other credible combination of voices which say we, are, we form an alternative. We're not looking for another alternative uh, guru of some kind. But if people are just going to be fighting and squabbling in this way, and you have local, uh, regional, this. But this is where I think the, the powers that be now have such skill and such um, um, power, material power, with uh, purses to back them up, that it becomes very difficult for even when you come close to a, a contest of leadership, or this state, that state, every time in elections, that somehow at the last minute, there's heartbreak, or there's some again, because, oh, 20 people have gone this way, or four people have gone that way, and all of a sudden, something else happens. And of course, there are these um, political leaders with their egos and their narcissism, uh, who all want to be, though, some of this or that won't come together. But I think that's the kind of a, probably, if you're asking me, that's the, probably the most credible, most likely area where change in some electoral form, purely democratic form, uh, could really uh, coalesce from. Uh, but for that to happen, that groundswell of people 
expressing themselves through struggle, that this is not really what it's all about. I think that, that, that has to continue and has to be. So really all power to, to, uh, to the people in the movements. And it's uh, so multilayered. It was fascinating listening to everybody, including those I, I made sort of, you know, I'm, I was teasing people who are not here. So is that, is that an oxymoron? But um, uh, anyway, but I think listening to everybody has been, has shown that at multiple levels, uh, there are very significant and very meaningful things happening. And uh, the, uh, the most heartening thing is looking at young people and the kinds of concerns and questions that they're asking and the dedication with which they are doing this type of work. You see, uh, it's easy with a good education uh, to get into the corporate sector, get into banking, uh, disappear, do something else. Uh, so people who actually have the lagan, the dedication to to go into this, to pursue social questions and take them to the point of advocacy and, 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 and this type of thing, I think there's much to be said for that. I think that's to be admired. So th that's where the hope lies, because as Shanta said, you know, the, the elite in, of that gener of this, our generation has effectively uh, lost out, because once we, the great uh, uh, post-independence uh, honeymoon period and the glory period, uh, those tinsel thing all came down, I think the elite then could separate itself and say, yes, this is the India we are familiar with. And um, Professor Andre Bethe, one of our great sociologists, he said, oh, what modernity, what Nehruvian citizenship. You scratch the surface and you see what comes out underneath. The same old patriarchy, the same old feudalisms, the same old uh, ethnicities, the same old thing and so on. And I think he clearly now in retrospect, uh, I was, we were most upset as students when he said anything of this kind because he said, what the hell, you know, the, look at the Constitution uh, and look at this, what the, this old Nehruvian thing is. And we all be be believed in that, uh, secular privacy still do. And, um, but I think uh, when you look at it in hindsight, uh, the long, long vision view, he had some sort of next revision about the kind of things going, talk, you know, what lay, lay underneath. And that's become the material that has been exploited. Um, I think, but it's against the will of the people uh, once they realize uh, what it leads to, but, that's, uh, I should shut up. So anyway, thank you for, for uh, having me here. I've been the learner, and I've um, met a lot of people, listened to a lot of people, and it's been, um, I'm most impressed by the work here, and I wish you all the best for the next. So I, I think on, your, on the 30th, maybe extend the sessions in going up to midnight or so. Uh, with, uh, <laughs> Um, that might actually give our time for discussion. Thank you. I think we might all want to run, catch, uh, catch their flights, but if they um, do, I'm happy. You know. Does anybody in the audience have any questions for Sir? That doesn't sound right. What, what, what happened to the argumentative Indians? Uh, you know? Anybody else? Okay, so um, for the closing comments, we'll invite uh, JVR Prasad Rao. JVR Prasad Rao, uh, former Union Health Secretary, Government of India, um, is also a special, uh, was also a special envoy uh, to the Secretary General of the United Nations on HIV AIDS for the Asia Pacific region from 2013 to 2017. As a Secretary for Health and Family Welfare from 2002 to 2004, he made immense contribution to the health sector development and was instrumental in drafting the National AIDS Prevention and Control Policy and the National Blood Transfusion Policy of India. Uh, sir has also been the ex-president of the CBPS board. I invite Sir on the stage. I think we are uh, running short of time. I, I'll just finish in five minutes because it's better that uh, we don't keep people waiting because people are coming from long distances. So I'll, instead of summing up, instead of giving my own opinion, I just wanted to thank all of you. I um, want to applaud CBPS for their contributions to policy research and evidence-based advocacy in the last 25 years, especially Professor Vyasulu, Dr. Jyotsna Jha, and all those who contributed to this effort, 
I was also uh, in the managing committee, even now I'm there. I was uh, briefly, I was president for some time. And I'm really impressed with the quality of work that CBPS uh, does and wish it many more years of meaningful contribution uh, to policy making in the country. Um, now that I have the floor, just a couple of points I want to highlight about the role of independent institutions um, and contribution to policy and then I will close. There are in actors like CBPS, which are independent actors, who ensure equitable distribution of resources and the protection of vulnerable and marginalized communities. I think that's very important thing that we, we need to do and play an important role in advocating for policies and programs that uplift marginalized communities. I think that's where we are. I wanted to just flag five important areas where I think organizations which want to be independent, which want to provide advice and guidance, policy advice to government need to bear in mind. First of all, providing unbiased information. I think this is very, very important. It has come out in a number of discussions in the morning also. <laughs> Data and important of, importance of research and how they're going to inform policy issues. And this should be unbiased research, not motivated research, like what goes on in the case of vaccine manufacturing, etc. So I think this is an area where, where which, which is very, very important when it comes to preserving the independence of an institution. Second is advocacy and lobbying. This is a continuous process that I think any organization which would be in this field has to do in all social sector areas. You can organize campaigns, you can engage in direct action sometimes to influence policy. But I think this is a constant uh, activity that any organization needs to involve. So advocacy and lobbying is very important. Third is conducting oversight and monitoring. Something which I think is good for civil society organizations, not just government um, evaluations and government monitoring of programs. We keep on evaluating those programs. We had some excellent presentations today by some of our young uh, researchers about evaluating government programs in the area of nutrition, etc. So I think that is a very important part of activity for a civil society organization. And litigation. We haven't discussed much about public interest litigation here. But at some point of time, I think it was great that a number of um, social issues got sorted out in this country through public interest litigation. We talked about Supreme Court. I mean, it is much maligned Supreme Court today. But there were occasions when the Supreme Court has taken the lead in bringing in a huge number of social sector reforms in this country. For me, who is connected with the health sector, I think the latest is that Section 377 of IPC, the way it is struck down, I mean, that required tremendous amount of commitment and courage. And right now, they are engaged with the same-sex marriages. I mean, we can't be accusing them of cowardice, at least in this particular case. And definitely, I'm, I'm very uh, sure that something positive will emerge out of it uh, for the same-sex marriages issue. So that is one area, I think, where we need to look at litigation and public interest litigation as an important area of action. And finally, collaboration. It is not that we have to I mean, adopt a confrontationist approach all the time. We need to collaborate with government agencies also, private sector organizations also, to promote specific policy objectives. And we have done this in the past. I mean, when we say government, it doesn't mean only government in Delhi, sitting in the government of India. The state governments, the local governments, at every level, we need to look for areas of collaboration and we need to look at every inch of available space to see that that collaboration is taken forward. So these five important principles are something which we need to constantly bear in mind when we promote an independent organization and see, try to inform policy space at whatever level that is required. I think, I think this is the thought I would like to leave with all of you. Finally, uh, because I was in the health ministry, I was associated with the health sector for quite some time. Health is an area we had a very important discussion, so I thought I will leave a few thoughts behind. It is, it is a state subject in our constitution. Even though government of India has so many programs, so much, such huge health budget, but essentially the delivery of services takes place at the state level. So if as organizations, if we have to really engage, we, have to, we should try to engage at the lowest possible level, which is the primary health care. We have talked about Anganwadi workers today. We talked about ASHAs, etc. We talk about community organizations working at that level. That is where I think the real action lies for us. Not just influencing some national policy which comes in once in 20 years. That is okay. That need to be done. But I think most importantly, how can we make a difference in the lives of the people at the grassroots level? I think that is where organizations like um, uh, 
CBPS, independent organizations can make a huge impact on policies which are adopted at that level. We heard about the Hosur Municipal Corporation adopting certain practices. You may not call it a big policy, but that is a good programmatic change. So those are the type of issues, I think, where civil society can make active contributions. And um, the most important thing I, am, I was impressed today is that listening to some of our young researchers, their enthusiasm, their commitment, I think it came out very strongly. And I missed yesterday's lectures, but I think uh, I was greatly benefited <coughs> by today's uh, talks by Dr. Reddy, Dr. Said, and all of you. And um, it's a great privilege to be here once again. I thank the organizations. Thank you very much.